There was no question Martin King could be his own worst enemy. He was at times unpleasant when drunk and in October 1936 a drunken escapade would land him in serious trouble in the village of Denham, Buckinghamshire. The saga began with King, an Irish emigrant in England, drinking half a bottle of whiskey before deciding it would be a good idea to venture out on his bicycle. Blind drunk, he veered wildly from one side of the road to the other before, somewhat predictably, falling flat on his face on the Harefield Road in the town. Now his timing here was impeccable. The police had already received complaints about his behaviour and a local constable, Eric Hayfield, had arrived on the scene in time to watch the 26-year-old Irishman attempting to climb back up on his bicycle. Constable Hayfield, however, didn't wait to see where this would lead and moved to arrest King. However, with his confidence bolstered by half a bottle of whisky, Martin King became belligerent and resisted the arrest. A tussle ensued and he told the policeman, I'll strangle you, you bastard. Such an encounter was only going to end one way. Before the evening was out, King was in a local police cell and then, while he nursed his hangover the following morning, he was hauled before a local magistrate's court, charged with being drunk in public and assaulting a police officer. Comical as the incident had been, these were serious charges. The assault of a constable could land Martin King in prison. However, ultimately, he was lucky. Constable Hayfield downplayed the gravity of the incident, saying he had not been hurt. The Irishman was duly fined just over 26 shillings, but rather than simply leave the matter lie, he went on to mount something of a rearguard action in defence of his whisky, insisting the remainder of the bottle he had been arrested with be returned to him. Surprisingly enough, the court acquiesced. Now, while Martin King may have walked out of the court that morning a happy man, the wider Irish community in Buckinghamshire would soon find themselves dragged into the case. The entire affair brought out the racist views that shaped attitudes towards the Irish in Britain in the early 20th century. Later in the week, when the local Buckinghamshire examiner reported on the incident, they highlighted King's nationality and employed the usual racial stereotypes when they ran with the headline, The Irishman and his whiskey bottle. Meanwhile, the details of what had transpired in the court revealed that the hearing had dripped with similar racism. The police sergeant who prosecuted the case, John Neal, had described Martin King as a typical Irish labourer. This was by no means an ambiguous phrase in 1930s Britain. Labelling King a typical Irish labourer implied he was trouble. To be Irish, and particularly to be poor and Irish, in Britain in the 1930s, implied a degree of guilt in the eyes of many. As we'll see over the course of this episode, racism towards the Irish community across Britain was pervasive and had taken on a fresh impetus since Irish independence in 1922. While Martin King's experience in Buckinghamshire had a comical aspect, the racism experienced by the wider Irish community on a daily basis was far more serious. They were portrayed as lazy troublemakers who were potentially dangerous, even subversive. Calls for Irish immigrants to be deported back to Ireland regularly surfaced in the press and from politicians. This would leave the Irish marginalised and viewed as outsiders in Britain, which would, as we'll see, have terrible consequences for some. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer. Irish emigrants to Britain between the War of Independence and the Second World War are something of a lost generation. Records of migration between the two countries only started in 1940, so we don't even know exactly how many emigrants there were. However, what is an undeniable fact is that Irish Catholics in particular faced a cold house in England and Scotland. Viewed with suspicion and frequently ridiculed, they often lived hard and difficult lives on the margins of society. This episode tells their stories. Before I begin, I just want to mention two key texts I used in this show. The first is Enda Delaney's Irish Emigration to Britain, 1921-1971, to and John Davies' Irish Narratives, 
Liverpool in the 1930s from the Historic Society of Lancashire and Cheshire was particularly useful in the section about Liverpool. Additional narrations are from Aidan Crow and sound is by Kate Dunley. Now to start the show proper, I want to return back to another October evening in the 1930s, this time in 1933. The location is the Scotland Road Methodist Church in the Lancashire town of Nelson. The congregation had gathered to hear a sermon from a well-known, if somewhat unusually named preacher, called Major Dane. Major being his first name rather than a title. Dane, however, had come to the Scotland Road Church to deliver a talk called England at a Crossroads. While the harvest of 1933 had been good, the preacher, however, could only see storm clouds on the horizon. The Britain he portrayed to the congregation was one facing threats on all sides. To a certain extent, this was understandable. Lancashire and the wider north of England was still reeling from the Wall Street crash of 1929, which had thrown thousands into unemployment. It was also a time of major social dislocation. Dane, in his sermon, lamented the fact that small businesses up and down England were shutting down in the face of competition from larger corporations. In the countryside, there was also huge change underway as well. The great estates of English landlords were being sold off, but as Dane pointed out to his congregation, small farmers were not getting their fair share. The wider political landscape was also worrying in the 1930s. Dane claimed that Marxists were taking over the Labour Party. Meanwhile, the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany and the formation of the British Union of Fascists at home in 1932 represented a new threat. Ironically, however, Dane had no issue with one of the favourite subjects of these fascists, eugenics. In his sermon, he went on to claim that the wrong type of people were having children. While he did highlight some of the real economic problems facing British society, as the sermon went on, Dane began to veer into paranoid rants. He railed against what he called the slop and filth of Hollywood. He labelled jazz the music of perverts. Science, he said, was eroding traditional values. And, as is often the case in such tirades, he could not finish before addressing immigration. Throughout his speech, Dane had been vague about who he held responsible for the wider decline he saw in Britain. But when it came to unemployment, he was very specific about who he held responsible. Whipping up the crowd, he claimed, The unemployment question is complicated by the invasion from the free state of something like three million Irish workers since 1915. West Scotland, Lancashire, Cumberland and South Wales are almost entirely dominated by this Irish immigration. The invasion, three million workers in less than 20 years, was a serious fact that statesmen should have taken notice of. Now, since time immemorial, exaggeration has been the stock in trade of demagogues, and Major Dane was no different. The figures he cited in this sermon were self-evidently false, even at the time. The number of Irish immigrants in Britain was nowhere near three million, nor could it be. If three million workers had migrated to Britain, Ireland would have been almost empty, given it represented about 68% of the entire population of the island in 1911. Furthermore, his claim that West Scotland, Lancashire, Cumberland or South Wales were dominated by newly arrived Irish was also untrue. Of the Irish immigrants who were arriving, they were no longer staying in the North West as previous generations had. The vast majority were now moving to London and the Midlands, where the effects of the recession that followed the Wall Street crash were having the least effect. Dane's sermon, as bizarre as it was in parts, did say a lot about the society Irish emigrants who arrived in Britain in the 1920s and 30s faced. It was undeniably one with considerable challenges, but in the minds of many, the Irish were very much part of the problem, when in reality, as we will see in this episode, they were very much helping to rebuild the economy. Now, before we get into some of the specific cases, though, we need to look at the context of emigration in the 1920s and 30s because it was considerably different in many ways to previous generations of Irish immigrants who landed in Britain. While racism directed at Irish Catholics in particular had deep roots in Britain, it had gained a renewed vigour in the 1920s. (laughs) 
the end of the Irish War of Independence in 1921 and the foundation of the Irish Free State in 1922 had dramatically changed relations between Britain and Ireland. Between 1801 and 1922, the two islands had been part of the one country, the United Kingdom, and with some exceptions, people were able to move to work as they pleased. The relationship, however, changed in 1922 when 26 southern and western counties of Ireland left the United Kingdom and formed the Irish Free State. This posed major questions as to how people from the Irish Free State who emigrated to Britain would now be treated, given they were technically foreigners. However, even those who favoured restricting emigration from Ireland knew this was far harder than it might initially seem. For example, the population of the Irish Free State had technically been born in the United Kingdom, which obviously gave them rights. Furthermore, Britain had insisted that the Irish Free State was not entirely independent, but instead a dominion of the British Empire, and therefore imposing restrictions on immigration from Ireland would somewhat undermine this argument. It was complicated still further by the fact that seasonal Irish labourers played a key role in the rural economy across Britain, even if many people were loath to admit it. In the 1920s, these factors combined to make limiting migration from Ireland to Britain very difficult and the government of the day chose the simplest option, to leave things unchanged and they allowed people to come and go as before. However, while the British government may have chosen not to try and limit immigration from Ireland, many of those in powerful positions began to target Irish communities across Britain almost immediately. Among the first to lead the charge, was the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. In May 1923, the church leaders endorsed a report commonly known as the menace of the Irish race to our Scottish nationality. This notorious document depicted the very presence of Irish emigrants, as the title suggests, as a threat. It fell back on age-old stereotypes directed against immigrants, claiming the Irish took welfare where possible, had little interest in helping themselves and were in general drunkards. One passage read, They have had an unfortunate influence in modifying the Scottish habit of thrift and independence. An Irish man never hesitates to seek relief from the charity organisations and local authorities. And Scotsmen do not see why they should not get help when Irish men receive it. Indeed, it must be said that Social problems have been complicated and increased by the presence of the Irish population. Generally speaking, they are poor partly through intemperance and improvidence, and they show little inclination to raise themselves on the social scale. Given this was endorsed by the leadership of the Presbyterian Church, racist tirades against Irish people in Scotland became a regular topic for Presbyterian ministers throughout the 1920s. They repeatedly claimed there was a dramatic increase in the Irish population of Scotland. Newspapers also reprinted speeches that often employed incendiary and dramatic language. Terms like, quote unquote, an Irish invasion of Scotland were common. In 1925, the Scotsman newspaper reprinted a speech from an MP, A.N. Skelton, who talked about hordes of Irish workers pouring into Scotland. The reality of the situation was very different. In November 1927, the Dean of Glasgow and Chair of the Glasgow Education Authority, Sir Charles Cleland, produced evidence in the form of school attendance figures showing there had been no dramatic increase in the Irish population in Scotland. Indeed, later census data would show that the Irish population in Scotland was declining dramatically through the 1920s. In 1921, there had been 159,000 Irish people living in Scotland. A decade later, this had fallen substantially to 124,000 in 1931. The racism the Irish clearly faced in Scotland, however, was by no means limited to north of the border. Next, we'll turn to look at how they fared in England. While the Presbyterian Church had been among the first to launch an attack on Irish immigrants in Britain, By the later 1920s, the Conservative government in London were following suit. While later claims increasingly focused on unemployment that followed the Wall Street crash, the Conservatives did begin targeting the Irish before this in 1928. This would see them establish an inquiry to review Irish immigration into Britain, focusing on the north of England and southern Scotland, 
using the police force as a source of information. This report would reveal deeply racist attitudes among the authorities in Britain. One passage, for example, read, The general feeling expressed to me was that the newly arrived Irishman is a decent, law-abiding, hard-working fellow, but that after a few years he degenerates, depresses the whole standard of living, and quite frequently falls into criminal habits. In fact, I got the impression that the elimination of the Irish from Scotland would reduce the crime statistics by 75 to 80 percent. Through the 1920s and 30s, the idea mentioned earlier that there was a quote-unquote Irish invasion of Britain underway continually surfaced in England. Now this term invasion was obviously deeply problematic. It inevitably implies some form of threat, which was presumably heightened in Britain, a country that was still recovering from the First World War. This term tended to gain traction in the summer and autumn months of each year when considerable numbers of Irish seasonal farm labourers left their homes in the west of Ireland and arrived in England to work on the harvest. The labourers did this to save money, which they brought home with them each year in the late autumn. These labourers, following in the footsteps of several generations of their families, often followed a similar route, beginning their work in Lincolnshire in East England in May where they would work on the early harvest. From there, they would move north into Yorkshire before finishing the year in Lancashire, where they harvested the potato crop. From Lancashire farms, they could easily then take the boat home to Ireland from the port of Liverpool. Now, this had been going on throughout the 19th century, and many Irish people returned to the same farms year after year, and in some cases, generation after generation. However, they regularly faced hostility. In Lincolnshire, for example, they were the focus of anger of organised labour as farm labourers' unions accused the Irish of undercutting wage agreements they had made with farmers. In the aftermath of the Wall Street crash in 1929, which resulted in thousands of industrial workers losing their jobs, tensions rose not only in Lincolnshire but across Britain. As early as April 1930, British trade unions were protesting the imminent arrival of Irish labourers demanding that their former members who are now unemployed be hired to bring in the harvest. This was a complex issue, to say the least, and blaming the Irish labourers who had been coming for decades was somewhat pointless. There was also questions over whether industrial workers were able to work on the harvest. Farmers certainly insisted on hiring Irish labourers because they claimed they were more experienced. One Lancashire newspaper described the situation as follows. There has been the usual invasion of the country districts by the Irish harvester, and as in recent years, much has been said against his coming. The critic's point is that the period should afford the farmer an opportunity for absorbing some of those affected by the continued trade depression, from the point of view, however, of the farmer, who still has decided preference for the worker from the Emerald Isle. The unemployed cotton worker, taken generally, lacks the experience necessary to satisfactory harvest. There is little doubt that the Irish labourers used to farm work would have been faster. In this situation, farmers ruthlessly exploited the Irish workers who toiled for cheaper wages, often sleeping in farm sheds. Their working day was also far longer than the average industrial workers' day would have been in factories or shipyards. Used as a pawn in this conflict between workers and farmers, Irish labourers were left deeply marginalised and treated with suspicion and racism by all in society. Even the left-wing Daily Herald described the arrival of farm labourers in derogatory terms, stating the English countryside was, quote-unquote, threatened by an invasion of farm labourers. While fears among English workers that they would find their wages undercut was understandable, Language like this was deeply problematic and did little to build common cause between Irish and British workers. On a broader level, one of the more frequent accusations directed towards the Irish in Britain in the 1920s and 30s was one that had deep roots, and this was that they were regularly drunk and only caused trouble. Now, a perusal of newspaper court reports from the 1930s would appear to support this. However, this does need to be treated with suspicion. When an Irish labourer appeared in a court, the newspapers frequently drew attention to their nationality, making the problem seem even greater than it was. Furthermore, as we've already seen, the police viewed the Irish with suspicion, which may have led to disproportionate numbers of arrests and court cases. 
This racism continued on into the courts where some magistrates didn't even attempt to couch their bigotry. In February 1937, a Birmingham magistrate, when addressing a group of Irishmen arrested for being involved in a street disturbance, when drunk, launched into the following racist tirade. We are not going to have any of your Irish business here. If you choose to come over here and behave like you do in Ireland, we are going to make it hot for you. You have to conform to our standards. The notion that the Irish needed to conform to British standards was rooted in an age-old idea that the Irish were, at heart, uncivilised. Nor was this racism in Birmingham in 1937 isolated. For example, in the same issue of the Birmingham Daily Gazette that reported that court case, another report told how a magistrate in the city had issued a warning to a young offender to keep out of the company of Irish people in the city lest he fall into further trouble. While anti-Irish racism was pervasive across British society in the 1930s, it would reach its worst in a somewhat surprising location, the most Irish of English cities, the port of Liverpool. By the late 1930s, the population of Liverpool City stood at around 800,000 people. However, it was a city in decline, having been particularly badly hit by the Great Depression that followed the Wall Street crash. It was also one of the main ports of entry for Irish emigrants into Britain, with regular ferry crossings from Dublin docking in the port. Now, while the city did have a sizable Irish community since the early 19th century, there had been a long-running sectarian problem between Catholics and Protestants, which saw violence flare regularly, and hostility towards new emigrants was nothing new. However, in the 1930s, increasingly regular accusations that the Irish had only come to avail of unemployment benefit and welfare in the city were repeated regularly in the press. Through the decade, a hostile atmosphere built up. By 1938, the Liverpool Daily Press would use the term infiltration to describe the presence of the Irish community in the city. This would lead to the establishment of an organisation called the Irish Immigration Investigation Bureau early in the following year. Formed in January 1939 at a protest meeting attended by well over a thousand people, this organisation repeated numerous spurious claims. The Bureau was the brainchild of a Conservative councillor, David Rowan, and it had come as no surprise that it fell back on misinformation to provoke fear and suspicion. One of the central claims the Bureau would make was that Irish workers had been employed in considerable numbers in the construction of an aircraft factory at the edge of Liverpool. According to rumours repeated by David Rowan and others, the Irish had actually left the jobs they had on this project in the autumn of 1938, when it seemed World War II was about to break out over the Czechoslovak crisis. These positions had then been filled from the ranks of the unemployed in Liverpool. However, when war had not materialised and the Irish had returned later in 1938, Rowan would claim that the English workers were all thrown back on the dole. Now, all evidence suggested that this was actually false. McAlpine's, the building contractor on the project, stated 95% of all the workers were from Liverpool, while evidence from the local labour exchange also refuted the allegations. However, Rowan and his associates in the Irish Immigration Investigation Bureau didn't care. They also tried the age-old method of parroting rumours that were impossible to disprove. For example, they asserted that when an Irish person got one job, they only worked long enough until they were entitled to get unemployment benefit, at which point they then contacted a cousin in Ireland who took that job while the original person went on the dole. The rhetoric they employed could often be dangerous. In the late 30s, the IRA started a bombing campaign in Britain and one Liverpool politician involved in the Irish Immigration Investigation Bureau called Mary Agnes Camella stated Liverpool as a city would rise and clear out the Irish if the bombing campaign continued. There's no question that the Irish Immigration Investigation Bureau had a tangible impact. For example, they succeeded in getting the Liverpool City Council to order the city's public assistance committee to submit regular reports on the numbers of Irish not only arriving in the city, but those already living in Liverpool. However, their repeated calls that immigration from Ireland be limited were not acted upon. The situation in Liverpool, and indeed across Britain, would only dramatically change in September 1939 with the outbreak of the Second World War. 
However, before I go on to look at how some individual people were affected by racism in the 20s and 30s, I want to mention one particular group of extremely marginalised Irish immigrants in Liverpool. This was the hundreds of women who arrived in the city each year after falling pregnant outside of wedlock back in Ireland. The stigmatisation of single mothers in Ireland would drive these women to leave their communities fearing how they would be treated. While this episode is obviously on the broader Irish experience, it's worth saying that these women were a significant minority of the overall numbers of emigrants arriving in Britain. For example, in 1929, the Liverpool-based charity, the Port and Station Work Society, helped 992 pregnant single women in Liverpool that year. 940 of these were from Ireland. These women not only faced discrimination from wider British society for being Irish, but they were also stigmatised by the Irish community as well. Now, as I say, though, the episode is on the broader Irish experience. And next, I want to look at the way racism impacted individual people in Britain in the 1920s and 30s. The impact of the racism outlined in this episode and the subsequent marginalisation and mistreatment was seen across the Irish experience in Britain in the 1920s and 30s. Perhaps the most serious incident was an event called the Kirkland Tuck Fire, when 10 seasonal labourers from Ackle Island died after the shed in which they were sleeping in burned down in 1937. The fire, generally thought to have been an accident, brought to wider attention the conditions in which seasonal labourers worked. The workers in Kirklintuck were sleeping on potato boxes in a building that would normally hold animals, an experience that was by no means unusual for Irish seasonal labourers. I will say before we move on from this, 45 years after that fire, an elderly woman contacted the Strathclyde Police in Scotland in 1982, claiming the blaze had in fact been started intentionally. She claimed she knew the identity of the person who had done this and that they had left Kirklintuck after the fire and changed their name. In 1982, the police did consider this evidence reliable enough to reopen the case, but two months later they announced that there was no justification for further inquiry. Whether this meant the claim was without basis, or that the passage of 45 years perhaps meant it was impossible to investigate it further, is unclear. While the shocking loss of life at Corklintock was the worst instance, the more common experience was one where racism saw people marginalised, but this too could have very serious consequences. For example, the death of the labourer James Kelly, who died in his 60s in 1937 outside the town of Corby, highlighted this. Kelly died from pneumonia and there was nothing necessarily unusual about this. But when details of his final days emerged, it became clear he was a marginalised figure in the community and this may have contributed to his death. Kelly had lived in what was described as an old hut at the edge of Corby. When he had fallen ill initially, he had approached the local police for help. They, however, just told him to see a doctor. A few days later, his condition had deteriorated and he approached a man who lived in a house near his hut, who subsequently did seek medical help. On arrival, the doctor found Kelly had advanced pneumonia. However, when he gave him some medicine, he left him where he was. The following morning, when his neighbour called on him, James Kelly was dead. The impact of the marginalisation of the Irish in Britain could also be seen in the tragic case of an Irish labourer, Roger Doherty, who died after a vicious attack in the lodging house where he was living in Newcastle in 1931. Several witnesses confirmed that they had seen his assailant, Mark Donnelly, the son of a local pub landlord, punch Doherty several times before stamping on his head. From the outset, however, Donnelly's defence focused their energy on the fact that Doherty was drunk and had been seen to fall earlier in the day. Donnelly was initially charged with the murder, but the judge then reduced this to one of manslaughter. Even though a post-mortem revealed that most of Doherty's injuries had been sustained in the assault, Mark Donnelly was actually acquitted. The question of whether his defence, essentially that the victim was drunk, would have been accepted if Roger Doherty had not been Irish is very questionable. Now this episode has focused on the experience of Irish people in the 1920s and 30s in Britain. Anti-Irish racism did not end in the late 1930s, but there's no question the dynamic changed after the Second World War. After 1939 onwards, the British government and wider society needed huge numbers of Irish emigrants to serve in the armed forces and work in war industries, both of which the Irish did in the tens of thousands. However, that's a story for a very different podcast. 
Before I sign off, don't forget to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. I have some great episodes coming out in the next few weeks, including one on movies that were banned in Ireland in the 20th century and one on a history of ghosts. Until then, Sloan. Thank you.